Good Welcome now to those of you joining us on YouTube as well. Uh, on the TCF side of things, we want to thank Itasca Bank for sponsoring this webinar. Sponsors like Itasca Bank help us to keep these webinars free for everybody. Contact us for more information on sponsoring. You can also help us keep these webinars free. After this webinar, you'll be taken to a page with a bunch of resources of things you might be interested in, such as our native plant guide, rain barrel information, and so much more, including our virtual tip jar. So if you're enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate to help TCF continue to do all of the awesome stuff that we do, because we do so much more than just webinars. We do a ton of stuff. Um, you can also check the box, you become a member, and then you can enjoy our wide variety of members only stuff, such as our series of hikes that we did this summer for our members. I did one out at uh, Lake Renwick, and it was gorgeous. So uh, become a member, and then you too can take advantage of members only stuff. We have been doing these webinars now for over a year every week. I can't believe it. It's, it's awesome. I just went up to the farm yesterday to collect my shares and um, had a gentleman stop me and say, oh, I've been watching so many of these webinars. I spent so many hours watching you. So um, it's, it's really great that everybody's stayed with us and keeps watching all of our webinars. So, um, but upcoming webinars on June 30th, we've got Urban Ecology of Coyotes. So everything you have ever wanted to learn, let's dispel some of those myths and urban legends about coyotes out there. Um, really, really looking forward to that one. I've been trying to find a coyote expert forever. So I'm really excited for our June 30th one. Um, and on July 7th, I will be back to talk about landscaping in the sun. We'll talk about all of our favorite sun loving plants to landscape with. All right, and with that, I am going to turn it over to our good friend, Kelsey from Possibility Place. We appreciate all of the um, help Kelsey has given us over the years and, and we love working with him and with Possibility Place. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Take it away, Kelsey. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, I see that there are a lot of, uh, a lot of people from all over the place. Uh, uh, it, there was a panelist in Georgia, I think, uh, that just asked a question. I posted a, a reply there. Um, and I think that most of what I'm going to be talking about today, uh, for most of you, because you, so many of you are using native plants, you shouldn't be surprised by some of what I have to say. Uh, for those of you that have heard me before, you know, I'm, uh, uh, I speak rather frankly, and, and I want to make sure that whatever it is that we, that I, well, that we are going to talk about later and what I'm going to be talking about as a presentation today is strictly about native plant use. Uh, I'm not going to be diving into individual species um, for particular needs because when it comes to natives, as long as you know your site, you're going to be able to accurately and successfully landscape your yard um, to a rather satisfying degree, I would hope. So let me uh, get the talk pulled up here. Uh, da -da -da. Excuse me for one second. There we go. Um, this is a talk that I have done before, and um, uh, it, it for those of you that have seen it, uh, it has changed quite a lot, or at least a little, from the last time. And it has to do more with how to transition into using native plants. But since so many of you are using native plants, this actually is going to be a little bit more focused. It's going to be on why the why native plant use is so important to everyday gardening and how it, we can actually benefit from it. Uh, the The whole concept of native plant gardening tends to be more of the um, <laughs> sorry, I'm rusty. Uh, tends to be more for those of us that are looked on and it's the weird ones in the neighborhood. Uh, people drive down the streets and they're so used to seeing particular things. And when they get to your house or mine, uh, it, they typically turn their head around because it doesn't look like everybody else's. And I think that's kind of unfortunate because you, it can look like everybody else's just with native plants if you're into that more traditional kind of setting. But when it comes to transitioning and using natives in a more, 
wider array. We have to kind of take, take the concept of using natives and push it into overdrive as a, as a gardener. If you're going to be using native species, finding out what species grow in your area, uh, finding out what species are going to do well in your yard are entirely different things than what are just going to be available uh, down the street at the local garden center. So when you, you know when you are transitioning and it sounds hard, but it's really, really, really not. It's no different than any other kind of gardening, depending on your level of care. If you're big into manicured lawns, there's native plants that will grow very, very happily for you. You can have that, that you can, <laughs> you can have that traditional looking lawn uh, or garden, but have it grown completely with natives. Or you can go what, what you see here and just go remove the lawn to heck with it and just go with whatever natives that are going to be growing in your local woods. So part of the issue when it comes to native gardening is the way things are done. You drive up and down the street, like I was saying, and you see things, you know, how they're already done. Uh, businesses, for example, I, 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 it kind of blows me away that they do any gardening at all. Uh, you know, you can see in this particular picture, they're imprisoning the people uh, coming out of, uh, out of the shop and the plants in the ditch. And then yet they mow the ditch like people are gonna be out there for a picnic. It's not a successful you know, approach to this. There's a lot of maintenance that goes into this one and they could have simply used native long grasses and never touched the ditch again. And still had it been very, very pretty. You go into parking lots and you see disaster after disaster. I have no words to describe what I see here other than blech. Anyway, uh, you know, homes um, that where you have very traditional kind of like yard door and then they put a tree in the parkway, not in the yard where it's going to be more successful, but they bullseye it in the parkway. Um, funny story about this, this will used to be one of my neighbors uh, long ago. And you can see that this has uh, three poles next to it. Um, Every time that that tree died, it got another pull after he replaced it. It got up to five by the time I moved. So it, 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 you see these kinds of things happen every day and everywhere. You know, you have the green wall effect. Nothing really wrong with it, but then mowing on the outside of it for what purpose? It's, it feels like a lost opportunity to use native plants, they can make this, you know, roadside successful and maybe, you know, not as boring. Or you can look at you got gardens out in the middle of nowhere and notice that their scale is way off. They plant a dwarf lilac 300 yards from their front door, like they're going to be able to enjoy it, but yet it's still there. It, it, plant use doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me on a general general basis or you can well you could do this uh i do enjoy the fountain in the front yard it was the only uh thing over uh we'll say a foot and a half tall in the entirety of that yard and that's a three acre that's a three acre mow job so you really got to love your lawnmower but that's pretty much how things are done and the reason why i i i, I see this kind of repeated time and time again and I've been doing this a long time, is, is that I hear, well, natives aren't pretty, they're weedy. When I plant them, they're going to take over and it's going to be a mess. Well, that's not necessarily true at all. Now, I'm going to ask you, you know, in all honesty, and how many of you are going to get this right, I can't tell because I can't see you, uh, but there's only one plant in these six pictures that is non-native. Only one. And I will let you all take a shot at it. Uh, we'll go for, like, let's say, uh, 10 seconds. All right, if you think you've got your, your, if you think you've got it right, I will tell you it is the bottom one in the middle. 
And that is the only non-native species to Illinois now, for those of you from around the way. Uh, all of these are going to be, well, not all. I saw somebody from Nevada. So most of these are going to be non-native. Uh, you have Aronia melanocarpa on the top left, Catalpa speciosa in the middle, Cladrastis kentuckia on the right. On the bottom right, you have uh, Physocarpus opulifolius. And on the bottom left, you have uh, Sambucus, oh no, they changed the name on me, uh, Racemosa uh, is the new name, or the Red Elder. The one in the middle on the bottom, uh, nobody should really be surprised, but that is our non-native pair that has become such a problem. But when I hear natives aren't pretty, it, it really is kind of disturbing to me because there is beauty in all of these plants. And just because something has uh, quotes in the name or it comes from a faraway land doesn't make it more exquisite or more beautiful than any of the native species that we have locally to wherever your locality is. You have an opportunity to embrace these plants and bring out their beauty by properly citing them and enjoying them for what they are and what and, and, and ignoring a lot of the pressures to use what's just commonly available. Because when you have a, something like a pear, not only are you affecting yourself, you, uh, you know, where you have the pretty, pretty flowers, but you're adversely affecting, affecting everything that's down the system from you. So in your local environment, you may only have your yard, but things like pear don't stay in just your yard. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. You know, furthermore, using natives versus non-natives, you can see the, this is uh, nine bark again, the physocarpus. On the left is the native uh, at about three years old. And on the right is the non-native at about three years old. Both of them in adverse conditions. Um, this one, the one on the left is at our nursery. It's just growing by the side of one of our greenhouses because we just decided to leave it to see what it would do. Uh, and this other one in a similar kind of situation with uh, a near a parking lot, the difference in performance is fairly significant. Uh, a lot of non-native species tend to brown out or die out in particular ways that make them hard to recover. Um, the species of nine bark, for example, once it goes under a lot of stress, you'll start to see green shoots come up from the base because it's not happy and it needs more food for what it is. So they're not as stable as our native species either. Plus anything with purple leaves doesn't give you fall color. It's fall color year round, but that's not a successful plant in the long run. But why these choices matter? I mentioned before, you know, uh, about the pear and it's going to be one of our, especially in the Midwest, on the East Coast, it's already a nightmare, but here locally, it's people are just now starting to become aware of its off, we'll call it off premise uh, impact. And the reason why that is, is because you see things like we line our streets with it to varying degrees of success. It's not a long-term species, yet we keep seeing city foresters and, uh, and um, um, residential developments and commercial properties plant these things, you know, like the Easter Bunny hiding eggs, you know, before the kids get up, they're everywhere. And we're told that they're sterile, but they are not. If you have two different varieties and they are planted anywhere that a bee can fly, then you're going to have cross-pollinization, which means that now you have seed, which generates things like this. And this right here is, um, I'm to a unintentional streetscape and it's underneath power lines if you'll notice. Now because pear is supposed to be sterile and they're not, they produce fruit and birds tend to eat fruit. And part of that is is because if you're in an area that has nothing but pear and you're starving, you're going to eat it no matter what because you need the energy. And when they eat this, they fly to the nearest power lines because there are no more trees. And before they take off, they, um, 
evacuate and you get these lines of non-native invasive trees that grow at the base of these power lines. It's one of the more common vectors that I see as I'm driving around and where there's a power line, there's usually a clump of, of pear and that's just the way it is. So these choices that we make uh, in, in our community and how we're going to be choosing species to be putting in our streetscapes, they really matter. And our voices are the only thing that we have because affecting policy and asking for things to be planted in our parkways is up to us. And we have to, we quickly have to change this or we're gonna be overrun with these things. Now, there are certain challenges uh, to native plant use. For those of you that have planted this, I'm sure that you've come across one or two of these. Um, I'm sorry, my face is over here. It's weird to talk to nothing. Um, that, um, <laughs> that you've come across more, more, more than one of these as you've uh, gone through your native plant awakening. Uh, there's conventional landscapes thought about species, which we've kind of touched on. Natives are weedy. They don't look good. They have very little in the way of commercial appeal even though of the top 10 shade tree sellers in the United States today, I believe eight of them are native plant derivative, which means they are a selected variety of a native plant, which, so if there's no commercial value to them, it, it, it kind of boggles the mind. It's just that when you say, hey, I'd rather have an oak tree, for example, and I say, oh, no, no, oaks grow slow. Well, that's nonsense. Uh, typical bur oak, which is one of our bigger ones here in the Midwest, will grow anywhere from 36 to 48 inches in a year. Chinkapin oak will go, grow anywhere from 36 to probably 60 inches in a year. So these are not slow moving plants. They take advantage of the space that's given them. And it also matters in the size that you plant them. If you're going to be planting trees, you know, the traditional landscape thought is, the bigger, the better, but it's also nonsense. The smaller, the better. If you plant them smaller, say at a, for a homeowner, you're gonna be looking to plant a inch, inch and a half tree. That's still a seven to 10 foot tall plant. So it's not nothing, but if you're planting a two inch tree versus that inch and a half tree, you have to keep in mind that it's gonna take two years before that two inch tree is going to be growing at a regular rate, whereas that inch and a half tree is going to grow regular today. So if you are interested in planting a tree in your yard, you need to make sure that conventional landscaping thought is blown right out of your head and you start fresh. Um, the whole idea behind what these plants are and what they're capable of, if you're going down to a garden center, they're selling you what they have there. And that's what they're interested in doing, not necessarily what's good for you or your yard. Now, while the information uh, about natives has gotten better, I mean, how to identify them is gotten better. Um, it's how we use that information. Uh, people tend to like to garden with color, for example. Um, so when you have your regular gardeners, uh, I get a lot of phone calls on a day-to-day -day basis of, I need something that's orange. And I recommend a pack of Crayola crayons because that's gonna be a more successful use uh, of their money rather than just an orange flower. Because a lot of times when you have native plants, they are suited for certain kinds of conditions. And there's going to be something for you but it's not the color of it that's really important. If you want to plant for color, these are pet plants, especially like uh, butterfly weed is going to be one of the more popular ones. Um, that likes sandy, well-drained, warm soil, not really exposed per se, but definitely out in the world and open. If you have a sandy loam or a nice sharply drained soil, you are gonna be successful with it. If you have a clay soil, like I do here at my home, I plant it, I know that I'm making a mistake. And after about three years, it goes away and I have to replant it. It's a pet. Um, I should put it in a pot, pull it around the neighborhood and call it Fido. A lot of times certain types of plants don't make it. So when you are a gardener, you look at your yard as, as 
you know, endless possibilities when really we have to kind of manage our expectations about what our yard is capable of supporting and go with the species that may not be perfect for it, but are going to be ultimately successful and make your yard beautiful. So it's not that you can change your yard to suit a plant because you can't, at least not in the long run, but you should embrace the, the conditions and the beauty of the species that will grow there for you. And that's a change in philosophy rather than change the earth. It's, you know, look inwardly and make sure that you can make your yard as beautiful as you'd like it by using species that are good there. All right. Um, experts in, the, in our field are becoming more popular. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with uh, Dr. Ptolemy uh, out on the East Coast. Um, locally, uh, you know, experts from the Morton Arboretum, the Conservation Foundation, people are becoming more and more well known. Um, not, you know, they're not celebrities by any stretch of the imagination, but they are well known. So when you mention names, I, I've, so I've read that book, or I've seen that person, or I've heard that person speak, they are, they are definitely more accessible in a way that, especially since the pandemic, um, doing these virtual kind of chats uh, definitely makes them more accessible. But it's not necessarily the access to them that's the problem. It, it, it's utilizing that information. And that's not really the expert's fault. A lot of experts like myself, I'm specialized in the uh, upper Midwest woodies in particular. But when, when you're looking for an expert locally, they're not always around as much and they're harder to find. And you travel much, much further. Um, I would recommend anybody that doesn't live in our area, you know, see who that local expert is on local plant material. Sometimes they're, sometimes they're very accessible. Sometimes they'll love to talk. And other times it, it's, it's very challenging to be able to get a hold of them because they've either retired or they've moved on. And that's not necessarily their fault. So we have to utilize the information that we can as we go through uh, our, the process of finding plants and information for our gardens. Uh, don't, be unre you know, don't be unrealistic about what these plants can do. Just planting natives does not mean that you do not have to water. It does not mean that that plant is going to grow without care. Uh, you're going to have to make sure that you stay on it, it like any kind of garden that you uh, well, unless you live in my house, in which case you plant it in the ground and you, you know, place bets on which one's going to take over first. You make sure that you minimize your, um, your unrealistic expectations on what these plants can do. A lot of native plants, they are very, very tough and they will grow here, but they still need water. They still need to be, you know, healed into your yard before they can be let free. And after that, well, then the level of care is entirely up to you. And lastly, they've become kind of trendy, native plants in general. Um, and I can't stress this enough. If a native plant uh, has a, a name like uh, Bridget's Glory or uh, Red Firework or something like that, it is not really a native. It's a cultivar. It is a native derivative, okay. Is that a step in a, in a better direction for those of us that want to transition over to natives? Absolutely, but it's still a cultivar. It is not uh, an example of what native species really are. You have to keep in mind, uh, a couple of years back, I believe it's um, um, echinaceas were all the rage and people had all different kinds. And my favorite was Magnus because it had no petals or very, very small ones anyway. And <laughs> it would not live very terribly long in most gardens. And um, it would crossbreed with the local populations of purple cone flower. And then you'd have seedlings that would come up. There would be these really weird kind of dwarfy with like lime, lime green kind of creamy petals. They look like it looked pretty bad. And then the plant that you paid a lot of money for didn't make it. And a lot of times when it comes to, you know, the cult of our world, the public is the testing ground for them. They're not necessarily something that is vigorously tested. Now that culture is changing. I know that uh, places like the Chicago Botanic Garden and others 
are, you know, they've got big test plots and they could possibly turn out some, we'll call them rather benign, um, you know, uh, native ours, cultivars, but it's still not as healthy for your yard as using native straight species. It's better for your pollinators. It's better for the plants themselves. You know, anything that has got separate genes is going to perform better in the long run than one that does not. Uh, another one, the hydrangeas are mildly hilarious. If you live in the South, you'll have really good success with a lot of the uh, um, uh, cultivar hydrangeas. If you live in the North, I believe uh, one garden center lady told me that the, uh, what was it? Uh, endless summer was nothing but endless disappointments. So you have to kind of be aware that where you live matters when you're using certain ones of uh, the cultivar persuasion. So uh, moving on, uh, taking, <laughs> moving on rather quickly, know where you live. Uh, you know, we've been talking about um, how, how we would, you know, manage and what, what kinds of plants would be good for your yard. You know, first thing, the first step is knowing where you live. The higher in the watershed that you live, the drier you are, the fast, uh, or the faster you are, faster you are, drier. It's not good English, but you know what I mean. Um, if you live high in the watershed, drainage is going to happen quickly. Um, the lower in the watershed you are, where water will sit, uh, sometimes you'll be in a perched area where water will be for a long period of time. You kind of have to know what this drainage is and where you live in it. Uh, it matters where you live because your soil higher in the drainage is going to be different than it is lower in the drainage. So understanding where that is first and foremost will get you uh, a step closer to recognizing the primary conditions in your yard. The other things you need to kind of know are whether you're wet, whether you're dry, whether you're sunny or whether you're shaded, or like most of us, if you're somewhere in the middle of all of this nonsense, you have to kind of figure out where you're at. And there is a palette of species that will be very happy to live and grow and make and be beautiful for you. The shadier and wetter you are, that it's gonna be very different than the sunnier and drier you are. So you'll go from a full on fern forest to what you see up here on the right, which is uh, sand prairie with, you know, uh, beautiful liatris aspera in that particular case. And, and you have to kind of be aware where your yard sits on the scale so that when you are asking uh, a professional to make a species list for you, or if you're going to go shopping on your own, that you know what species or you have an idea of which genuses you want to focus on to be more successful. And an example of this is this. Um, this was a client of mine many years ago. And when I first, this is what I first saw when I pulled up to the house, a kind of a typical McMansion. Now, I don't typically deal a lot with the McMansion set. Um, they don't have a whole lot of use for me, but when it comes to this particular project, it got very interesting rather quickly. I had to stop and take a picture of the place because I couldn't believe that somebody who lived in a house like this would call a native, uh, you know, a native weirdo like myself. And when I drove in, this is what I found. Kind of your standard set of plantings, you know, hosta in full sun, red bud plant in the middle of the yard, crabs that were being unsuccessful, weed, weed barrier and rock uh, and the gravel mulch uh, that, you know, it, it was way overused. It was mildly spectacular and very predictable. Um, and this was my favorite. Um, when I pulled up to the house, he was, he couldn't take the gravel anymore because he couldn't walk on it at his bare feet. And um, he wanted to get rid of uh, this particular shrub. And I was looking at, I had no idea what it was. And I wish I had a picture of it after we talked about it. I'm like, nah, you should leave it. I mean, if nothing else, it looks like, um, you know, an ode to, uh, you know, the tests and in, 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 you know, in the Southwest uh, before the war, you know, maybe you're into nuclear power. I don't know. It, it was a very interesting talking point. And I said, just let it go. Now, if you look, uh, above the man on the left-hand side, and you see the forerunner there, that's that same shrub, and that was six months later. It grew eight feet that year, and it turned out to be uh, viburnum prunifolium, 
I had no, when I rolled up, I had no idea what it was. I, and it took a couple of months before it dawned on me what it was. It had the flower first. I had no idea, but this is where we went with the, with that front yard. Uh, we went heavy into grasses, as you can see. And again, this was only six months later. It's cr it was a crazy amount of pro uh, progress in just that short amount of time. So I took that picture in late February, or no, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a liar, uh, in, in April. And this was uh, sometime uh, in September. That's six months, right? Sounds like six months. And the growth on the plants that they put in in that first year were just mind boggling. And not only that, but we put in eight oaks in that front uh, horseshoe drive, which all did very, very well. You can see here, um, the plants grew cr crazy good, mostly because the soil was relatively undisturbed. Uh, even with that big, you know, big house over there, it was just a little bit on the compacted side. After we ran a, um, a fracture plow, plow through it, it did very, very well. They, and they also, because um, people like this have a little bit of spare income, they put in um, a irrigation system that pointed only into the beds, not at the yard, and the plants responded incredibly well. He liked it so well, in fact, that he wanted to do his ditch in it. This ditch was about 300 feet, two, eh, 250 to 300 feet long and about 12 feet wide. Now, um, he had no qualms about spraying the grass dead, um, which you can or you can't, uh, you know, it, depending on how you feel about it. But we planted, I believe, over a thousand plugs, uh, five trees and 20 shrubs in that distance. And uh, within a year and a half, it had knitted together so much that the house on your left, that you can kind of barely see it in there, mostly disappeared. It was quite lovely. He was not popular in his neighborhood. There's a whole story about that, but that's for another time. So what's possible? You kind of see what people can do if they really have uh, the resources and everything to go from one style of landscaping to another without working too hard at it and really not giving up that semi-formal kind of look. But some people have different levels of comfort. And if you're going to be going about planting in your own yard, you have to figure out what that comfort level is. If you can't grow grass, like this one was another client of mine, you could get all creative and go, go to town with the woodworking and let nature fill in the gaps for you. Or, you know, you can let your HOA uh, do something about the, uh, you know, do something about that edge uh, uh, on the retention pond that, and make it beautiful, except for that one neighbor, and you can see who that particular neighbor is. And, and because, you know, rocks are better than plants, apparently, but guess who had all the goose poop? That guy. You know, so when you are able to have these, this, this, this opportunity and you take advantage of it, you can make things truly beautiful without making a really big impact in your yard. If you have a, you know, uh, an alleyway that you cannot plant well, but it drains and is super dry all the time, you can plant your natives there. Or you can go crazy and plant them on the roof. Um, this guy comes every year and he does a very interesting job. Um, he's, he is also not popular with his neighbors. But because of what we're used to, we have certain kinds of anxieties about what the neighbors might think, but I wouldn't really worry about it. Most neighbors look like this. You know, this home has been in here uh, for more than 10 years. And this is kind of how it goes. People don't really think about it. They have all this opportunity and they don't really embrace it as much as they might should. Uh, you know, and, and it's not just in the front yard because people don't normally live in the front yard. They live in their backyard, right? So maybe the backyards would be better, but they're not. Every, every one of these homes has been occupied. Every one of these homes has had an opportunity to do something. Now, times being what they are, 
I, you know, okay, uh, free income, you know, what do I spend my income on? What do I do? But most of the, most of the subdivisions in the Midwest have neighborhoods that look just like this. Not a lot's been done. And it's kind of unfortunate because what we can do might look something like this, might be as simple as this, just replacing my lawn with Carrick's. You know, I don't have to mow it as often and it's nice and green still. If I want to go a little crazy, I can do this. This is a park, but this I've seen this done at homes as well, where you have uh, an opportunity to do something a little different and have it look just as good as any lawn that you'd have, but maybe it's too much. So for those of you that have, you know, <laughs> and this is not fair because most of you have used uh, the you know native plants, uh, you can take a screenshot of this if you need to, but when you're coming, when it comes to planting these kinds of things and transitioning from that yard to maybe that kind of like sedge replacement lawn, you know, a, a flat of 18, well, that's a kind of a standard flat of pints. That's what we sell. A bunch of uh, nurseries around, around the region will sell you pints. Typically, there's 16 to 20 per flat. Uh, those will cover roughly 45 square feet. And if you need to do the math, you take your square footage and you divide it by 2.25. And that is a plant on eight, 18 inch on center. And that'll give you kind of a rough layout. Now this is only for perennials and really it's only for grasses, okay? When it comes to the rest of the planting because you're gonna be planting them on a grid. Um, so if you're putting things on 18 inch on center, it makes a square. And in the middle of each one of those squares is an opportunity for, you can see in this particular case, I planted um, uh, prairie smoke and uh, uh, dodecathium. So GM and, di and dodecathium in the middle of my grasses. And once the GM and dodecathium were done flowering, the grasses grew up over the top of them and I didn't miss them at all. Okay, you can see behind me the liatris coming up over my shoulder. That's also is something that can be planted in these squares. And they're meant to grow like that. That's the way that they're comfortable growing. The more grasses you have, the better you're going to be able to manage your localized humidity, that you're gonna have a more underground, uh, a very diverse underground root system, which is gonna help raise the carrying capacity of water. So you're gonna be able to get more water held on site, which means you have to water less. And with the shade, you're gonna have fewer weeds, especially if you plant fairly thickly fairly thickly. Anyway, um, it should be pretty good for you. Um, I'm trying to think here. Uh, green. Oh, and definitely uh, green end up, brown and down when you're planting these things. I know a lot of times people will, um, you buy things that are dormant or they'll be severely cut back because um, they're converting, uh, they're saving uh, on water or on shipping or something like that. Make sure that you definitely get that root system planted nice and firmly in the ground. Uh, and no deeper than what your ground level is. In fact, with perennials, it should be dead even with the soil surface. With woody trees and shrubs, which we'll talk about now, they should always be planted about an inch above the surrounding soil surface so that the roots um, have a more downward trajectory. That way you uh, eliminate maybe circling roots that also would eliminate, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, um, a situation where you planted a plant too deep in the ground where it's not getting enough oxygen to that root system. And especially if you're going to be planting B and B, make sure you shave the ball down. Find out where that root flare is. Uh, I recommend uh, a piece of steel, um, something something you can drive into the ground and find the root, uh, root flare. That way you know how far you need to shave the ball down so that it goes into the ground raised, uh, a, you know, at least dead even with the surrounding soil so that it, it doesn't further complicate root development or uh, root structure. Now with the woody plants, uh, a shrub needs uh, only about, a, for spacing wise, only needs about 12 to 15 square feet uh, of area, okay? And a tree needs about 40 square feet, that's it. 
Okay, that means that shrubs um, typically need to be about on four foot centers. You can go further. Nothing wrong with any of that. We have to keep in mind the further you are apart, the longer it's going to take them to grow together. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they ever will when they are far, you know, further apart. So if you're trying to do a mass planting, they need to be a little bit closer together. All right, and there's no right or way, uh, right or wrong way to plant, you know, these things. It, it there, it really, when it comes to arranging them, uh, you can go the more traditional route: tall things in the back, low things up front, or or not. It's really it's your house. So if you want the tall things out front so that you get to enjoy the short things in the back by you, that, there's nothing wrong with that. And like I said before, bigger trees are not better. They grow slower. They take longer to, uh, to regain their vigor. And uh, this is most important, the bigger the caliper, the higher the mortality rate after five years. And that's an important number. Typically, You'll see, um, you know, uh, a lot of garden centers will have a season, uh, you know, if it dies this year, bring it back, we'll get you a new one. Great. But typically the larger stuff, there's enough energy in the ball and in the root system and in the, in the trunk that most of them are going to live between three and five years before you're going to notice the kinds of problems that are going to creep out. And mortality on trees three inches and bigger is higher than 25% over that period of time. So that means that seven and a half out of 10 are probably gonna be fine, but I don't wanna be the other part. 25% is too high. Um, anything below two inches, typically your mortality rate with, again, you, and this is requisite care. So depending on the species, you're gonna to have to care for it. And this goes for the bigger ones as well. You're going to, you're, you, you shouldn't see a mortality rate higher than say 8%, which is a significant increase. Uh, and spacing, uh, kind of mentioned it before, the closer together, the further apart. There's really no such thing. I mean, I've been to the woods a lot in my career. I have never seen uh, or see, I've never seen a gnome or a fairy uh, pull trees back to the perfect distance apart so they develop properly. That's mostly nonsense. Uh, I get why some of that is a thing because they say, oh, well, trees have to do what uh, Actually, I don't know. I don't know why they say this. Um, you know, certain species. Yeah, okay, I get it a little bit. But I've been planting these things for a long time. I've been observing them for a long time. Trees that have, like, say, a double leader. And if you look at this group here, you'll see the one in the back has got a double leader. I, I've seen them for a long, long time, and I, I had one here in my yard until a tornado hit it, and it took a tornado to rip one of the crowns out of it. So, I mean, it's not just going to fall down. And, uh, you know, be aware that, that there may be a little bit of science in the, you know, well, you can make this tree develop properly. Trees are going to develop how they are going to develop. The more you leave them alone, the healthier they will be. So pruning things like rubbing, you know, uh, branches that are rubbing, things that are broken, uh, limbs that are dead, keeping a tree healthy that way, perfectly acceptable as far as I'm concerned. But when it comes to, you know, overly pruning a plant because you need to recover the crown, I don't really, that doesn't work a lot of times. Now these are bur oak here. Not one of them is more than six feet apart. I personally planted them on two inch centers. Um, so if you're ever in Wilmington, Illinois, you can see those. Uh, it, 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 to, as of this day, I planted those when I was in my teens. I believe those trees are uh, better than 50 feet tall at this point, and they're beautiful. They're the biggest trees in the neighborhood. Now, uh, plant protection, very quickly, for those of you that live in urban areas, and those of you that don't live in urban areas, is a very key point. If you plant delicious plants, you are going to have a lot of visitors that you did not invite to your home. Um, I do recommend fencing them appropriately. If you have a lot of deer, then you're going to be, you're going to want to put in a higher fence. If you have rabbits, you're really just going to want to protect the base uh, of the species that you're, you're, you know, you're concerned about. Because if you don't, you know, they chew off the top like they did here. And that was a pawpaw. Uh, from experience, they taste terrible. Not the fruit. I'm talking about the plant themselves. It's, oh, it's awful. Um, and yet they'll still eat it. So, I mean, if you're starving, 
you'll eat your own shoe leather. And this is clearly when, you know, what deer are doing when they come through a yard that is planted out a buffet. But if you have rabbits, you have other problems and they'll come in and strip you bare if you're not prepared for them for certain types of species. Uh, they like to girdle roost. This is Carpinus on the left. They love to girdle that one. You need to make sure that you put in your care so you don't lose on your investment. So why convert or add natives to your landscape? Well, there's a really simple thing um, that kind of drives this home for me. Um, and lately it's been pollinators and it's super simple about it. If you don't have these, you don't get these. So if you don't plant host species and, or, you know, you're like, oh, I support pollinators. I plant, you know, I plant all these non-native things, but that doesn't give the, the, it doesn't give them a home to live in. It doesn't give them a place to raise their babies to, you know, give you something interesting because these are interesting, you know, two, actually all three of these are as big as the palm of your hand or bigger. These are not tiny caterpillars. They make your yard interesting. And the damage that they do typically, except for that guy on the bottom left, is negligible. Uh, the guy on the bottom left is that is the uh, yellow dog caterpillar, and uh, it'll eat tilia and your uh, tilia, the um, uh, wafer ash, and the xanthoxylum, the prickly ash. It'll eat them right to the ground. So be aware that uh, <laughs> you you may have to sacrifice a couple <laughs> to have interesting pollinators, but it goes for bees and other types of pollinators as well. And what I mean by other types of pollinators, I mean these guys, maybe not, maybe not the snake, but birds, bats, they, they all feed into that food web. And if you want these other things to be healthy and come to your yard, you need to have that first group to get the second group, to then get the first group again, to feed the third group. I guess that works. Yes. Um, you you want to make sure that you understand that you will bring in life to your yard that is as amazing as the plant material that you're planting. Now, there's also an unintended benefit, and it's social. When it comes to using native plant material, typically, especially civically, it becomes a social event. You know, you have native plant sales when we used to be able to all get together and hopefully will again soon. Uh, hello, and for, you know, to everybody, uh, hopefully in the future. You know, you, you people come out for these things. Uh, this, uh, the one here, this is in Lake County, typically two to 3,000 people show up for this. It's not, you know, people come out. It's an event. They want to talk. They share stories and they're amazing. There's also the opportunity to work with schools, to get with kids, to let them get dirty during the school day and plant areas that are no longer productive for school use since this is a rain garden that we put in. They have these wonderful kind of overflow into your life and the kids and the, if the parents, it, the interaction can be very, very special. Or if it's just on a very personal note, say you just want better family pictures, you know? Native flowers that come and go make for great photo opportunities for those of you with the, you know, with the sugar bug. You have these wonderful opportunities to do that. And the more that we embrace natives and bring them into our everyday lives also opens us up to these more kind of civic, you know, uh, I don't know um, events and, and opportunities to interact with other people that use native material and share those stories and get people more on board with how beautiful they really are. Um, you know, and for God's sakes, if you wanna see stuff like this, go for a walk in the woods. Does anybody have any questions? I did that again, excuse me. Um, we ready? Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. We do have quite a few questions already. Right. So let's dive well, right in. I'm trying to stop the sharing. I don't know why I cannot stop sharing. I'll help you with it in just a sec. Here we okay. go. Got it. Got it. All, All right. right. 
Um, so we have a question, what's the best way to source plants, native plants locally? I'm in Lake County and feel like I don't see a lot of natives even at nurseries and I struggle starting things from seed. Um, most people are gonna have a lot of hard, a lot of hard time, excuse me, I'm sorry. They're gonna have some difficulty um, starting from seed in general. Um, a lot of seed requires um, certain types of preparation. Um, the closer you can keep your process to nature, uh, the better off you're going to be. Just scattering them on the ground is typically a loser. Um, you're going to want to keep a, keep a flat, something that you can keep uh, hydrated artificially and that you're going to be able to let uh, pass through a natural process, especially the natural process of winter. It's a very important point that if you're going to like let your, you know, use native seed, you have to let it pass through that. The refrigerator is great, but at the actual process is much more effective. So um, keeping them in a cold frame, maybe starting them that way would be uh, one way that I might approach it. But as far as sourcing local, uh, you know, local material, there are growers out there. There, like myself, we we do a mail order, which until recently, uh, where we had to switch shippers, has been kind of a roller coaster ride. Um, we also had to, um, uh, you know, you, well, no, you, excuse me, as a buyer, you're going to have woody plants are going to be much easier for you to find. Um, what, there are growers, Lake County, um, I think most of them are wholesale, but I'm, it, during this kind of weird kind of time, uh, places like uh, Woody Warehouse down by Indianapolis, uh, ourselves, uh, Possibility Place, uh, maybe Majestic Oaks and uh, uh, Taylor Creek and a handful of others may be able to supply you. Prairie Moon does a mail order thing. There, there's a lot of, uh, of options out there. But the thing is, when it comes to natives, people like myself and these other companies grow them. And so that means that there's a finite amount and they can only produce so much at one point, one point in time or another. So when you see them available, don't wait. And for whatever reason, if you think, oh, I, oh, I only want one. Well, most of us don't sell just one. So, you know, you're going to have to buy them in, not so much in bulk, but as a group. And so I would recommend to anybody that's going to be purchasing native material that and you found a grower and that can be challenging. Um, there is a website. Uh, I should have been more prepared. My apologies. There is a website that lists a lot of the native growers. Uh, I would check with your, 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 what your local native, uh, native plant societies, uh, Indiana's in pause, Illinois is the Illinois native plant society. Um, you can also check with the wild ones. They listed by state where you're gonna be able to find particular growers, uh, especially ones that advertise with them. Uh, so you, you will be able to find them and, but you're gonna to have to follow their rules and purchasing. Not all of us have retail space. So it's something to keep in mind. I hope that helped. Yeah. Uh, and like you mentioned, there's lots of different places to go. It, your local extension, uh, if you have an ag extension in your area, they're another place that you can ask um, for resources as well, wild ones, and as well as the Native Plant Societies. The Illinois Native Plant Society is wonderful and they've got tons of resources on their website as well. But if you type in, if you, for wherever you are, uh, the, you know, the guy from Georgia and, and Nevada and everything, if you, uh, if you type in like native, uh, it's just a simple Google search, native, uh, native nurseries in my area, I believe that website that, that I cannot remember the name of it, it's gonna make me crazy, but they have, every native grower in every state and they're, they're usually their contact information and if they are by appointment or whatever, or if they have retail, a lot of them will, it's listed that way. And if, uh, if I can find it, I will send it to, uh, to Jamie so that that can be posted for you. Uh, Laura wants to know, what if one's ultimate goal is not to, simply to be pretty or only native, but rather as a means to draw birds? How do you plan differently? You don't. Um, you just, when you're going for birds, uh, most people think berries immediately, and that's a fallacy. Um, birds, yeah, they'll stop for berries, sure. And if you want to have it part of your palate, absolutely. But most of them are going to be going on insects. Uh, so hummingbirds, for example, hummingbirds and wrens and chickadees uh, rely on oak trees more than any other species. Those little tiny ones rely on the biggest trees that you can possibly put in your yard. Uh, and most of that is because they rely on spiders 
and the micro caterpillars, the little tiny buggers. Okay. And uh, uh, chickadees, I think I was reading God, a number of years ago, one clutch of chickadees will go through between 20 and 40,000 caterpillars per clutch, which is it averages out to daylight hours of one caterpillar every two minutes. So for that, the length of that clutch. And so if you're going to be going for birds, the first thing you should be planting is an oak tree. Uh, depending on where you live, uh, I would recommend a burr, uh, but a chink pen will do in a pinch, um, mostly because the acorns are smaller. And if you happen to get hungry, you just grind them right up, makes a really cool flatbread. Interesting. So, uh, but as far as other birds, uh, make sure that you have varied habitat um, clustered in different parts of your yard areas that are very open and areas that are very closed. Um, so if you have a small yard, uh, I, I'm like, I'm on, um, I have a little bit larger lot. I'm on uh, just short of an acre. And um, I, have, I have parts of my yard that I never visit because I don't wanna, whatever's living there, I don't wanna to bother. So I, I make sure that it's kind of a closed off area. And then areas that I interact with more, I keep more open and make sure that, oh, uh, always water, um, especially flowing water. Um, the bird baths are great, but that's, uh, you're probably going to want some kind of moving water that brings them in much more than the baths do. Yeah, excellent. I also did a previous webinar on beginner backyard bird watching. And in there, I go over some different plants that are good for birds, different ways to set up your backyard bird station, including talking about um, having water sources and things like that too. So that might be something um, to go check out on our YouTube channel. All right, Tiffany wants to know, how do the Carexes do with ticks compared to a traditional mowed lawn? Like ticks, like they can't do, they have to deal with the letter C or something or what are we talking about? Well, I think ticks like, um, you know, they, they talk about some plants. Um, oh. uh, like a honeysuckle, I think is one that encourages ticks and uh, you know, um, is, is there a difference? No. Have you heard of any? No, no, uh, I, I haven't either. Uh, here, the thing about ticks is, is that, um, their numbers are growing, um, with, with the warmer weather and the milder winters, you know, we're getting more and more and more of them. Um, the, the ones that really like in my yard, I rarely will get one in my yard and I have a very natural, I don't spray, I don't do anything like that. I have uh, somewhere between 250 and 300 species in my yard and I rarely get a tick here. And um, I've got tall grasses and everything like that. And the only places that I ever really get them is where I have water, where it's closer to water. So if I've got a ditch that holds water for a period of time, I know that I got to pull my socks up, you know, uh, but aside from that, uh, I don't think you're going to see, um, an increase or a decrease one way or the other if you're going to manage your yard like that. Uh, mowing does not get rid of ticks. So it's not like you're, you know, it's the process of whatever it is that you're doing. It's just the likelihood that you're going to have them is either you're gonna or you're not. It's not going to be because I have a lawn or because I have a lawn replacement with Carrick's. Yeah, I know I've heard. So A, having native plants may encourage some of the things that eat ticks to your yard, like possums are amazing. Tick oh, they love them. They eat them like tic tacs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the thing to keep in mind is, is that the more you spray, the more likely you're going to have ticks because you're killing the sh uh, uh, stuff that eats them. Uh, so you want the things that eat them and things that eat them are other bugs, other bugs chow down on them hard, especially spiders. So it's something to kind of keep in mind that when you're out there fogging away and with the group that with this high of native IQ, I kind of doubt that that's a thing, but you know, anyway. All right, Sandy wants to know, uh, wondering what root depths on grasses might be. Uh, really depends. Um, like big blue stem, for example, they've traced the roots down in relatively undisturbed soil down 30, six feet. I think, yeah, it's, 30, it's 36, 38, somewhere right in there. Um, and other plants like, um, like drop seed go down six to six to 10, typically. Um, as far as root depth goes, 
uh, native grasses go pretty deep. Um, as long as the ground's not overly compacted, otherwise they'll, they'll hit that barrier and then they'll run left or right. And that's something to kind of keep in mind. Um, if you're going to be planting these areas and you can, you have the opportunity of fracture plowing in, uh, an area before, or if you have, if you're lucky enough to have relatively undisturbed soil. So any house built before 1985 uh, typically has, uh, they didn't really um, compact the soil as bad back then. Uh, but, you know, uh, the root depths can get pretty, pretty deep. As far as penetration goes, like lawn grass, I was at six inches, if you're lucky. So, I mean, um, two you, three, but yeah, the, the more you have, the more of these native grasses you have, the more that raises that carrying capacity also helps break clay up. The deeper your roots go into clay, the more organic matter from up here gets down to here. And then that way it starts to break that clay up and make it more palatable for other species. Uh, Lisa wants to know, is it possible to transplant native trees? I have a few sugar maples in my horse pasture that need to come down, but I'd like to move them to my yard instead. They're approximately 10 feet tall and one to one and a half inch diameter. Uh, the one, yeah, I mean, you'll need a spade. Um, you'll have to probably get in a Vermeer spade and have it come in. I would recommend, uh, typically it's um, a minimum of 24 inch on that spade. And I think that's wide and down. Um, a sugar maple is going to be more successful than hickory because you're going to be able to scoop up that tap root uh, that, that might form with sugar maple. It's very unlikely that a tap is formed in any meaningful way. So, I mean, that at least at that size. Um, but it make sure it is sugar maple. Okay. If it's a fool, you know, sometimes they're foolers. Uh, some of the Norway that grow out in the open like that, they'll have smaller leaves, but look for the petiole. When you break a petiole off, if there's like a, if it's like opaque or almost white and just chop it down and have a fire, it'll be fine. All right. Uh, Amy says, I started a bunch of different seeds I collected from plants I already have. I started them outside in February. I know some plants don't transplant while their first year. Typically, how long should I keep them in planters before transplanting them into the ground? Immediately. Uh, make sure. Soon, I, I mean, as soon as soon as that root system has uh, started to um, grow laterally, and so typically you'll get the tap, and then as soon as you start to see lateral hairs come off the side of the uh, main root, then it's time for it to go. Uh, make sure. Oh, oh no! Excuse me you want second and third leaves. So you'll have your first leaf. As soon as the second and third leaf come up, they can be transplanted. If you wanna wait a little, it's not gonna hurt them any, but you make you wanna make sure that if it's a hardier species, it does better the sooner it goes in the ground. So the more aggressive the root system, the faster you need to get it out of whatever you're growing it in. If it's something like say dodecathion, it could be two, three years before it comes out of that damn pot. Um, because they're just, uh, ooh, you can grow old waiting for those. They just don't grow quickly, but when they start to grow, it's, it's mildly spectacular. And sometimes, uh, species like that, that take a while to get rolling. Once they're, once they start rolling, they don't really stop. So it's kind of, that's kind of a benefit there. And also, um, plants that are tubers or bulbs, wait till they go dormant, like, uh, Camassia, for example. As soon as that thing goes dormant, scoop it up, cram it in the ground, you'll see it next year. Uh, Nancy wants to know how best to keep some natives from becoming invasive or from taking over a landscape. And what are the names of some of the soft grasses you don't have to mow? Um, some of the names of soft grass. Um, soft grasses that you don't have to mow. So like um, like lawn replacement, like the uh, care, anything in the Carrick's uh, Pennsylvania line uh, Rosia, Radiata, uh, was, is it Moria in that one? But anyway, um, those typically are going to be your part shade uh, lawns. Uh, for more for for more of the sun kind of lo uh, loving kind of group, if you have sandy soil, then you could go with, uh, it used to be called Boochlow. I don't know what the I don't know what the new name, if there is a new name for that one. And that one, that any that that does pretty well. Uh, uh, agronom, uh, Irograstus spectabilis makes an interesting lawn grass. Uh, for those of you in Illinois, if you're driving down 55 
or um, yeah, 55, as soon as you get down toward Pontiac, there's big waves of that stuff all over the side of the road. It's kind of pretty um, and going out on 80 as well. Um, so that one's tough, but then I don't know how much of a lawn replacement. I like the Carrickses a lot more um, for that, especially for the, for those of you that kind of um, um, have like a, a shady area where you can get rid of a big patch of lawn and actually plant this stuff up and let it, let it go uh, because it doesn't get very, very big. I'm doing it on the corner of my yard and looking at it right now. It's a, it, it helps um, <laughs> at least calm your mind that I don't have to mow it ever again. Um, and what was the other part of that question? Um, so part of, part of what I wanted to go into with this question here is um, she oh, says invasive. keep natives from becoming invasive. And so that, that kind of distinction of, I think it was you I heard one time say you can't invade your own home. No. <laughs> when we talk about native plants, you don't, we don't call them invasive because some of them are just more aggressive than others, but invasive is for something that doesn't actually belong. Invasive, here. invasive is for something that doesn't belong here. And no, you can't in, uh, invade your own home. Oh God, I haven't used that one in a long time. Um, <laughs> I love it. Know, I use it all the time. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> you know, if you, if you live there, it's yours, you know, uh, and some of them, like, um, I'll, I'll use a, there's two examples that I like to kind of like touch on the asters and the solidagos. Okay. They're no longer aster and solidago, but the names now confuse and anger me. So, um, you keep in mind that those two groups can be very pushy and, I have to man, although I do have to manage those in my own yard because I want all these other species to grow. Now, in the areas where I've got uh, a, pretty, uh, a pretty high balance of species, those particular species don't become pushy. They only go into areas that have uh, opportunity for them. So I have a, I have a couple of areas of waste ground uh, that I turn over regularly because I'm I'm throwing vegetables or whatever else into it. And they'll pop up there because the seeds will blow into that area. There's no competition, so they go absolutely bananas. And it can become a gardening problem environmentally or landscape wise. It's not as big of a problem that I have found because when there's some of the areas that they've taken over, I also don't have any weeds. So they like push thistles out. I and mean, if they're going to push a thistle out, I'm all for it. But you know, for those of us that like a little bit more manicured type lawn, then I just avoid species that will take advantage heavily on open ground. And I would just not use that particular group. So, um, you know, it's kind of a shame too, because solidagos and asters host an amazing array of caterpillars and beautiful butterflies. So maybe minimizing their use or using species that are more palatable um, would be an appropriate response to that because invasiveness really is for species that don't, they're not, they're not from here. They don't belong here. A lot of cultivars can get that way. The pair that we talked about, I mean, these are popular landscape species yet they are big time problems. So just be aware that maybe if you're going to, uh, have an issue with certain native species to becoming pushy, just avoid them altogether and plant something else. Some, uh, a more like species, you know, you don't have to plant an aster, but maybe uh, you can go with like a mist flower or something along those lines. It's just as beautiful. I'm using it ornamentally, so it's not necessarily in its proper place, but I'm getting the look I need from that without using the species that are problematic for me personally. I love Monarda but oh uh, man, that oh, thing man. can just take over. I've got Careful. an area in my yard. I'm constantly pulling them out and I feel bad because I love them and they're so pretty and the bees love them, but yeah, boy, they really just good get in tea. so tall. Very, very, very good in tea, especially the flowers. Oh yeah, okay. So, right. but I mean, that means that you also have to be a harvester and be home, which I'm not much. So anyway, who, who's next? We have several questions and um, I'm just, I'm gonna kind of lump some of these together. Um, for any of the specific questions about, you know, what plant should I put here? What plant should I put here? We're not gonna get into that today. Um, I do have other web webinars that I've done on those kinds of issues. If you check out our YouTube channel, 
Um, they can also like reach said, out to me at my office if they want to, con you know, contact for specific stuff. I, I do nothing but talk all day. So as, as do I, so <laughs> it, you feel free to, to private message, uh, you know, email yeah, either one absolutely. of us and, and we'd be more than happy to, to go into that uh, privately with you. Um, but there's been several questions about uh, people who want to learn more. So any apps or resources or places, people who want to learn more about native plants, learn more about the botany, learn more okay. how to ID things better. Okay, for, um, oh boy. Well, one, um, wow. There are not a lot of just online resources that I have found that are, that are good that now there are more now there like i said before there are a lot more than there used to be uh if you are if you have more of a sailor a sailor's persuasion and you don't mind cursing uh there's a guy who does a uh a series um from around the country uh if you live in a place he's probably been there it's called crime pays but botany doesn't I've been wanting to watch that. I haven't okay. seen it yet. Now you have to be okay with cursing. Everybody, all 130 of you that are still here now <laughs> have to understand that when you hear words, they are not meant for you. Uh, but there's that one. Uh, Ptolemy, I, uh, Ptolemy's book is always going to, it's going to help you with the concepts. Uh, general botany. If you live in Illinois, you can't go wrong with uh, reading some, uh, what is it? Um, uh, Mullenbrock put out a book, but his, it's the concept of it is for Southern Illinois, but, uh, it's, what is it, do I have it here? I don't, um, dang it. Uh, but it, anyway, it, it, but it goes into like local ecology and everything like that. It's by Mullenbrock. He also put out a lot of, uh, a lot of book series on general botany. That's very good. Sally Weeks's book, um, uh, from Purdue, uh, really good. If you're not familiar with botanical terms, uh, here I have this, I recommend, uh, I made a mess, excuse me. I recommend that, can you see this? I don't know. This illustrated Glossary of Botanical Terms. Yeah, the Cambridge uh, the Cambridge Illustrated Glossary. So I use this as was one of my teaching aids years ago, because you can copy the pages easy, uh, but it's got, pictures and the words associated with them. So if you want to like kind of better familiarize yourself with what, uh, you know, particular terms mean, what serrated means. And if you're interested in the like kind of like life of trees, then um, uh, Peter um, Woolenben, Woolenben? Uh, The Hidden Life of Trees is another good book. Uh, as far as classes go, uh, I believe it's got a lot of really good ones. Which one? The Arboretum. The Arboretum. The Morton uh, Arboretum. If the Morton Arboretum. I, the Morton Arboretum was better than the Botanic Garden, as far as general botany and and in going into that. There's also a bunch of online ones with the University of Oregon, of all of them, uh, and I don't know what those cost because I didn't pay for them. So you know, okay. but uh, there's oodles of information. And if you, any of you have more questions, uh, I will sit and ponder it, uh, see what I can come up with. But yeah, I mean, that's, those are good places to start. How do you feel about apps like um, Picture This or Plant Snap or Seek? You know, um, years I ago- I like Seek because of the, the um, crowdsourcing aspect of it, but- I prefer iNaturalist. Seek is by iNaturalist. They're there. It's the same, oh, the same group. Okay. Same database. Yeah. Um, I prefer, I prefer them, um, to the rest of them at Harvard uh, the Harvard herbarium years ago, put out, I think the first app on this where you take a picture and it, you know, the algorithm would run through and it would get you to usually to genus, okay. but that really doesn't tell you a lot about that particular type of plant. Um, so uh, I use iNaturalist simply because I post things there, um, it, it, not a lot, but um, it, it, those kinds of apps where you're going to get a lot of experts. Plus, uh, if you have more questions like Facebook, uh, the um, Illinois, Native, Illinois Native Gardening thread uh -huh. and, the Illinois Native, and the Illinois Native Plant Society thread work pretty well um you know uh for for local knowledge uh like paul what is it um markham 
from downstate usually posts a lot and okay. he likes to he likes to hop on and so you get a lot of the experts that are sharing their time that way and that helps out a lot i like the illinois native gardening site because there's a lot of very knowledgeable people on there who are commenting and sharing sharing educational type stuff people sharing pictures of their gardens and all of that if if your goal is just a you know down and dirty what is this plant there's just a straight plant identification group that's got some amazing botanists in it that do yeah. some amazing work with some not so amazing photos so <laughs> you know uh you know i i yeah and every day that i get phone calls i get to do it without photos so you know you kind of <laughs> play this game of plant roulette and, and just be aware that anybody who is going to uh, be relying on these as a primary source you if if you're any if you're going to be science-based at all that they, they will give you the idea and then you have to find two other sources to back that up so if you can't find two sources for that particular idea um or at least close to it then it's probably just most likely an opinion probably just most likely it's a lot of double negatives but that's not the point you, you make sure that you can back it up so let them take you to a place and then try and find that data. Don't look to prove it, that's dangerous. Make sure that you look for the you know, things that's like, okay, no, they weren't full of it. Look, it's here, here, and here. Okay, and then that's then you can go with it. And it's not very hard to get there. It's uh, like Wikipedia. It's- Well, Wikipedia will help they're you. A good help. Place to, they're yeah. a good place to start, get you pointed in the right direction, and then you and can do more research from there. Make sure that if it's not a primary source, um, and a lot of times primary sources are hard to deal with, understand that uh, that those opinions will help get you to the right part of the primary source that you need to be to help you find the information that you're looking for. But it, it's, a, it's more of a journey rather than, oh, there's the answer. You know, a lot of a lot of scientists when it comes to what you should put in your yard, it's not it's not opinion, but it's my idea of what your yard might want be and you need to help I, I can help you get to a place, but you need to carry it through. Um, we are really yeah. running low on time right. here, but native um, plant sales. Um, hold on. I see one for native plant sales really fast. Uh, Right now, there's a lot of us that are holding uh, online plant sales, Possibility Place in general. Um, it, uh, we, do have an, uh, we do have an online store that we do ship. So, I mean, um, and I think the Conservation Foundation has a link on their website someplace uh, that they get, uh, if you purchase through their link, they actually get uh, money for programs like this uh it is, is a thank you uh it's so they get a portion of each sale that is made we just changed shippers so hopefully our usps nightmare has finally come to an end well, it's not as bad as fedex but uh, boy um so uh anybody that's interested that way um native plant sales in general there will be in-person native plant sales in the fall especially for woody plants uh we're doing one in st louis uh we're doing one in uh, two in Lake County. I don't know with who. I think they're Wild Ones groups. Um, there's typically the end person one in the spring in Indiana Dunes. So there are ones that are coming back. The Conservation Foundation has a tree and plant, uh, tree and shrub yep. sale in the fall as well. So yes, we, we are coming back. It's just, uh, it's going to be clunky. Uh, people still don't know how to shake hands or be polite just yet, but we're working that way. And I think that. Uh, you should make sure you keep on top of your local native plant group because they should have some eyes and ears on those situations for you. Good plants, small places, use our plant finder uh, on our website uh, for those people that are looking for particular types of plants to match certain types of spaces. Uh, it'll help you dial in a native plant list that is uh, workable. I think Love that, that. Oh, that mini plant finder. I use it myself all the time. The last one is that Minnesota, uh, Minnesota. Oh, I was just reading about this. Who, there is a native plant group in Minnesota. Um, um, oh, if you email me at my nursery, uh, just go through the info. Uh, uh, remind me you're from Minnesota if you're still on and I will, I, I have it at my office. I don't have it here. There's a native plant group up there that uh, 
that does a lot of outreach and I cannot remember for, they will help you find your, your plants from that way. Sorry, that's all I need. No, that's, <laughs> I just that's, that all, that's it perfect. Made, made me like jump into my head real fast. Sorry about that. That's perfect. I, some of us just love nerding out about stuff like this. And that's totally cool. So beaver? anyway, was there, was there one There's more person with a question about a beaver? Yeah, uh, fencing does work for a beaver, but it's got to be big fencing. I recommend red top. Uh, it's a kind of fencing you can pick it up at Farm and Fleet, and you're going to want to double it up. Good luck. Beaver. Yeah, I know they can be pretty determined little critters. Determined. Those are those are the angriest <laughs> man. I accidentally sat on one once. That was, uh, I, I, I thought it was a rock. I swear to God, I thought it was a rock. It was dark out. We were all just sitting down by the river and I sat, put my hand down and it was wet. I'm like, can it just rain? I thought it was a rock. And then it made this noise and we all left. It's all, anyway, good luck with Not your beaver. story I have heard from you before. No, I, that's, that okay. was interesting. That was a different kind of evening too, because I fell in the river. That was, that surprised the heck out of me. Anyway, Anyway, thank you to those of you who have stuck around with us for this long. We're going to wrap it up here. If you have any more questions, if there's any questions, I apologize we weren't able to get to everybody's questions yeah, today. Email but me. Yeah. Email, email Kelsey, email me. Um, all of the information about the webinar comes from my email address, so please feel free to drop me an email anytime. I will forward them on to Kelsey or I will answer them myself. And thank you again. We hope oh. to see you in the next couple of weeks. Use the Conservation Foundation links to get your plants uh, from us locally. If, uh, yes. you know, if you want bigger stuff, contact me directly. And by all means, I, I am, all I do is talk to people all day, so I'm happy to do it. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Take care.